Hello everyone and welcome to the Compaq Asset Management Market Wrap YouTube update. I'm Mo Ansari, president of Compaq Asset Management and also the host of Market Wrap, which you've been tuned in, tuning in for the last 30 years. You can get the daily update uh, simply by going to the address below that is on your screen right now and going to the Apple Store or the iTunes Store or the Google Store and getting uh, that app. If you have the app, it's a free app. It'll give you the daily broadcast that I do, the one hour broadcast that I do, which is nationally syndicated that you can get directly on your iPhone or your iPad or whatever device you have, and you can listen to it at your convenience. I'm going to talk a lot more about the markets. I'm going to talk, start with a pandemic update, where we are as far as the pandemic is concerned and its impact on the U.S. economy. Road to elections. I have to talk about the election today. Uh, it is, uh, and I'm going to look at it strictly from an economic point of view, how it's impacting the economy right now as we all get more election anxiety. As you've heard me talk about for the last couple of weeks, that this anxiety is going to ratchet up. And with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing, it has really brought it to the forefront. I think we are going to see this for about another week, then we'll move over to the debate and how the debate, which I believe is going to have the major impact on the elections. I'm also going to take a look at the technicals. What is the language of the markets trying to tell us? I showed you the charts a couple of weeks ago where we talked about that for the last few weeks. I've said that we've had the NASDAQ on a sell short-term trading sell signal, which I don't use, but it gives me an idea where we could be headed in the next few weeks and why I thought the market could be going lower. And I still think it could, and I'll talk about that a lot more later on in this update. Let's start with the pandemic. We have moved a number of uh, trials from phase three. They've, got, uh, they've gone from phase three to phase uh, to a limited uh, approval of a vaccine. So we've got two more now that are in phase five or five of them that are in phase where they are available to use. But they haven't been gone through the phase three trials, as I call it, where you've got 30, 40,000 people that have gone through the test, all different ages, all different uh, all different kinds of underlying situations that people have. With that, I think we need to wait. I still think, as I mentioned, by the end of October, we should have a vaccine coming out of phase three trial, uh, AstraZeneca, it could be Pfizer, it could be um, uh, Moderna, either one, all of these could come out or one of them could come out. And then we'll st start mass production. Probably we'll have the vaccine by the end of this year or somewhere in the first quarter of next year available for mass distribution. Now, who will get it first? All that will have to be decided, and I'm sure we'll work through it. The people who need it the most first should get it. That's how it's going to go, but we are moving towards that. But over the last uh, week or so, we've seen a number of, uh, uh, of troubling signs as far as the COVID is concerned. We're seeing Europe, a resurgence. Today, we heard that uh, Britain is thinking about reimposing a lockdown, or if not a lockdown, some more restrictions on mobility. The same thing is being talked about all over Europe. Consequently, the, today we did see the euro go down, the dollar go up a lot, and that is having obviously an impact on a number of these markets, especially the gold market, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I saw a startling statistic the other day in the YouTube the, in, from Yelp. They said 163,735 U.S. businesses closed uh, in Mar on March, uh, since March 2020. 163,000. 60% of them have permanently closed. They're never going to open again. So we are still seeing the impact of COVID on the economy. A lot of that was sort of buffered or helped out by the stimulus. It was filling in that huge hole that we had in the economy. But what are the prospects of CARES 2, as it's called? That is the new stimulus package. I'll talk about that and the prospects of getting another one done or CARES 2 or another COVID stimulus plan coming out is fading and dimming by the minute. I'll explain why a little bit later. But looking at the COVID, if you look at the Spanish flu, which was, uh, which was terrible, we see a tremendous amount of deaths. We did see a lot of deaths in ages 85 and over because of COVID. And if you look at uh, 75 to 85 year olds, we're looking at a tremendous amount of deaths, but in COVID, if you compare it, 
it is not quite as bad as the Spanish flu, even though we have 200,000 people just about as of today, we're getting very close to 200,000 people that have died because of COVID in this country. So it is historically, if you look at it in historical terms, it's not the, uh, the, the plague or the Spanish flu, but it is a tremendous virus that has literally crippled most of the Western economies. We've come out of that. We have snapped back and we did come out, but we've plateaued and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But as far as the virus is concerned, the infection rates are down to about 20,000 a day now. They were close to 60 in the United States, uh, but they were way down in Europe and they're starting to surge. The wave, the second wave is starting as the cold weather comes in, sets in. People do not go outdoors as much. They're in much more confined spaces. And with that, we are starting to see a resurgence in Europe. Is that wave going to hit the United States? where we have not totally controlled the virus in the first phase or the first wave or whatever you want to call it, it has subsided, but are we going to get another tsunami coming our way? We don't know that as a fact yet, and hopefully we can get to the vaccine before we get to the next wave here in the United States. Looking at the U.S. economy, you can see that we've seen one of the fastest recoveries ever of a bear market. We went all the way down and snapped right back up. It only took us 126 days to regain all the losses that we had when COVID hit and all the losses that we saw in March, but we gained all of them back. If you get back to the last, prior to that, when we had a decline in the market in 1966 to 1967, it took us 310 days. And that's what it took us. If you take a look at the 1961 60, to 63, 434 days. You look at the 187 to 89, it took us 485 days. So this is one of the fastest recoveries that we are seeing ever in the market go down and the market go up. But now we're in September and that's where we see a lot more volatility. Same thing has ha happened. There is Tina. There's no other alternative. If you look at the dividend yields on the S&P. We were somewhere close uh, to, to what the bond yields were higher last in 2008. But as the in interest rates declined, uh, we saw the dividend yields far surpass uh, the, the, what you could get as interest on, on the 10-year note. And I'll talk about the 10-year note, which I think is a critical indicator of where the economy is and where we're headed next. And I'll show you that chart, which I've included in my technical analysis later on. But looking at the yield, you can see that the S&P dividends came down. The yields were higher, so it was better to be in bonds than stocks if you were trying to find an alternative. But right now you can see that this is where we are in yields or in the dividends, and this is where we are in yields. We're at about half a percent on the yield, and we're still close to 2% or 1.8% for the S&P dividend. So we're getting three times as much dividends from the S&P than you would get from a bond. And that's why people are looking at saying, where do I go? The only two alternatives I've talked about is one is real estate and one is the stock market. When the Fed and the, and the Treasury are putting trillions of dollars into the economy, it usually shows up first in two places, the stock market and the bond market. And that is why the stock market was up. It had gone up very quickly because we saw an unprecedented amount of uh, stimulus from the Treasury, that is uh, fiscal stimulus, and monetary stimulus we saw from the Fed. That has been unprecedented. The market was hoping for, for a second stimulus package to be passed, and we might still get it before November, but in October, uh, Congress leaves, the session ends, and then we have to look at it after the election. So we only have about a week to 10 days, and with the acrimony that we see in Washington right now, because of the Supreme Court nomination, it looks like the Democrats and the Republicans have gone to their corners and it will be difficult to get any kind of stimulus package done. If you look at the reasons for a quick recovery in the economy, we saw the un un unprecedented Fed and Federal Reserve and Congress putting money into the system. We saw the expectations that America would, we would get through uh, COVID very quickly. That was the hope. That's what everybody was looking for that we would get this under control. 
Unfortunately, we have 20 to 25,000 people still being infected on a daily basis, and we're seeing somewhere close, to it's dropped below 1,000 people that are dying every single day. Also, we saw the businesses, the technology that we have now is a lot different than we had in the past. We could, so many of us were fortunate enough that we could work from home, like seamlessly, it was just like flipping a switch and all of us could do that. But there, and that, that's where the big tech companies really gave us a leg up. We had the Zoom and we do our meetings, we can do all of our work from our office. As a matter of fact, in the last probably six months, I've been working more than I have in the last six years. And that keeps, uh, obviously tells us the technology is a big part and the beneficiary of that have, they have been the large tech stocks. And we're looking at some individual investors. People have more time on their hands. Everybody has become a trader. Everybody can go and look at their screens and they're sitting at home in front of a screen because they're working, but they also have more time to trade. So we're seeing individual investors returning to the market and especially the younger investors coming to the market, in, which is a good thing in the long term. Unfortunately, a lot of them are looking at derivatives and doing options and puts and calls and leveraging, leveraging everything up, which in turn will cause a lot more volatility. And that's what we're seeing. We're also seeing a lot of momentum traders. They, they listen to people on the radio like me, or they listen to watch somebody on television and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do just because I heard Mo say this or whatever happened. But that's not the way to trade. As I always say, you have to do your fundamental work you have to do your valuation work, and then you have to look at the technicals. I remember in the 80s and 90s, nobody talked about technicals. Everybody was looking at, oh, I got this report from Wall Street. It tells me about this particular stock. We've come full circle in the last 25 years, and everyone has a computer in their pocket now where they can literally do charting, analysis, which is obviously a lot better but that people are looking at charts and graphs, but that is not the end all in trading. You have to, if you're a short-term trader where you're going to buy and sell every other day or every five minutes or 15-minute trades, yes. I've traded off the five-minute charts, which I used to do a long, long time ago. But now uh, I think as an investor, you have to do all of the fundamental and the valuation work first before you do the technical analysis. We've come full circle. Now people are looking at technical analysis first and fundamentals and valuations later. I think it has to all be done simultaneously where we look at all of these at the same time and then make the decisions. September, you've heard me talk about this for the last month or so, is usually the worst month of the year for the stock market. And that is going back for 92 years, going to 1928. Look at it, September is usually the worst month of the year. We come and make a bottom somewhere in the middle of October and then we start the rally back to the upside. That's where the old saying, you sell in May and go away, and that's where it comes from. And then you come back in October and start buying in. But if you missed the, this time you sold in May, obviously you're, st you're way behind because the market did go up a lot in June and July and August. As we saw, we made new highs earlier on this month. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were new all-time highs for the NASDAQ and the S&P. So selling, uh, I, I thought we'd get more election anxiety uh, obviously, it is starting to really ramp up, and you will see a lot more election anxiety over the next few months, over the next 43 days. So be prepared for that, but please do not make your economic decisions based on your political anxiety. Uh, politics and economics are like oil and water. They usually don't mix. Right now, it is being impacted. We do see this uh, This. Uh, anxiety build up as we get closer and closer to the election. Oh my God, if he gets elected, that'll be the end of the world, no matter who it is. We've had elections before. We go through these elections and the markets can figure this out. The only thing that really concerns me is uncertainty. If we do not get an answer from the election, a clear cut in election, we don't get a clean election where we are sitting on November 10th or 15th and we still don't have an answer to who the president is going to be, I think that will complicate things. We're looking at a number of those options. We've looked at that if we don't get an electoral college majority, then it goes to the House and the Senate where the House votes for the president. Each state only gets one vote. All the congressional uh, delegates get together and decide who they want to vote for. And then the Senate 
so there's only, you'd only need a simple majority. And then you also need the Senate, which picks the vice president. But that is an extreme situation. And if they're unable to do that by January 20th, then we get the Speaker of the House becomes the president. So I don't think we've looked at all of these options. I don't think there's a high probability that we are going to get that. But we could see a delay in getting uh, the results. It could be a few days, and that will be a very anxious time. Markets can figure out if it's a Democrat or a Republican, uh, what the policies are going to be, which industries are going to benefit, which ones could get hurt, and we'll figure all of that out. But if we don't know, then you don't know. It's the unknown unknowns that really concerns us. And that's where we are looking at all of those options. And you have to be prepared and look at those. Um, and the, uh, the stimulus too, that's what everybody was talking about, round two. But uh, it seems like the Republicans were getting ready last Wednesday. We heard that the president wanted to uh, go to uh, the Senate and say, OK, we go to the House and say, the House wanted $3.5 trillion, a $3.5 trillion stimulus package. The, Democrat, the Republicans said $1 trillion, but the president last uh, Wednesday said, let's uh, go and make it, bring it up to about a trillion and a half. I thought they would agree to $2 trillion. You heard me say that a few weeks ago. But now, uh, with Ruth Bader, with Ginsburg not being there and the Supreme Court fight at our hands, I believe that it will be very, very difficult to get anything done in the next uh, 43 days or so. So where do we go? The market started to realize this today, that there's no more stimulus coming, at least for the next uh, month and a half or so. We have to be prepared for that. And with the rise in COVID, that was a concern. And then we have China concerns. China has put out the, uh, the list that they might put out. They haven't put that out yet. They put it together on companies that they are, think are not good companies for China, where they could put restrictions on U.S. companies from doing business in China. As the president has uh, put restrictions on TikTok and WeChat, or he's trying to do that, there's been some compromises done in that. I think the president realized that if he did go forward to that, that China would put, put out that list and could hurt American businesses, consequently the stock market, as it would impact some of the largest technology firms. So I think we are going to stay where we are. China is not, it did ramp up a little bit over the next few days. Uh, but we are going to continue to decouple from China. I've talked about that for the last year. I, I think uh, that we are not having a trade war with China, but we are entering a cold war with China, which is a much more significant uh, uh, decoupling from China. How long and how, how long it will last and how it's going to impact us, it we'll find out in the next 10 or 20 years who is going to win. Let's talk about the elections. You can see that the returns in the last year of the election on a presidential cycle is usually the worst year in the market. Uh, we were up a little bit, now we're coming back down a little bit. I think we're gonna end up somewhere around uh, the highs of the year, between 35 and 3600 uh, by the end of the year. But for, between here and there, uh, it's going to be a lot more volatility. So tighten your seat belts, be prepared for volatility in these markets. You can see that uh, when the incumbent, there's no recession uh, two year, in the two years prior to the election, the incumbent has won every single time. But if you look at, uh, there's only been one time that an incumbent has won when there was a recession in the prior two years. All the other times, the president, the incumbent has lost. So uh, we don't have a large data set, but we have enough data that shows that the economy is going to play a real big part in this election. Even though now and that we have the Supreme Court fight uh, that is going to be the center in politics, but that might... Uh, be good for uh, the pre uh, might not be good for the president because it takes away uh, the focus on the economy. On the other hand, it might not be good for Ms. Mr. Biden because it takes away the focus on the virus. Uh, so it brings in a totally new unknown right now as far as the Supreme Court. It's going to be the center which takes away from COVID and the economy. Who's going to benefit? We really don't know. Which side could uh, could come out ahead with this one? But if it does, uh, but if the COVID starts to resurge, we get a resurgence in the virus, that could be a very big negative, like we're starting to see in Europe now. And usually when we see Europe, it's about three to four weeks later that we see the impact here in the United States. If you look at the balance of power, uh, full democratic sweep 
is in the car. It could happen. That is something that people are talking about right now, that there is uh, a chance that the House and the Senate both could go Democratic and the presidency. The chances that we'll have a Democratic House and a Republican Senate is about 39 percent, and then we're looking at both. Republican is a very small percentage chance that the House and the Senate could become Democratic. So where do we get the ramifications of all of this? If we get a Trump uh, president, we get a Republican Senate, and we get a Democratic House, which is uh, the highest probability right now. Uh, taxes, that would be a plus for taxes. That's what we could see. We could see it's good for regulations because there will not be as much regulation if we see President Trump and the Republicans. Fiscal stimulus, uh, the Republicans have said, look, we only want to do one trillion. So they don't want to do as much as the Democrats want to do. They're getting concerned about the budget deficits, which they should. But in the short term, that would be an unknown that we don't know. On the trade policy, obviously that's a negative. The president is expected to be uh, much more hawkish. I am going to have uh, probably, uh, we are going to schedule uh, Peter Navarro if we can, and somebody from the Biden campaign. Mr. Navarro, as you know, is a, was a professor right here. You've heard him on Market Wrap. Now he's the president's advisor uh, towards the trade policy towards China. Uh, and you've heard him here on Market Wrap a lot of times on the broadcast. So uh, we're trying to schedule him and somebody from the Biden camp so we can see where both of the uh, clear cut, what are they going to do with China policy, which is obviously something of a concern that we should all be thinking about. Virus management is also an unknown right now. We don't know uh, who will benefit, what would happen if we get a Trump uh, uh, presidency and, uh, uh, and a Republican. If you go to Biden, uh, as president, Republican Senate, uh, and a Democratic House, then taxes, I don't think anything changes as far as taxes are concerned. The President Biden can try to change things, but the Senate uh, will definitely stop him from doing that. As far as regulation, the President can put a lot of regulations in without congressional approval. Obviously, he can appoint people to run the EPA and a number of these other agencies which can put out regulations whenever they want to. So I think that would be more regulation, which uh, would be negative. Fiscal stimulus, I, I don't know how much the Democrats can do. Uh, they, I'm sure they want to do an infrastructure spend bill, which would be very positive. Trade policy, uh, the, right now the feeling is that Mr. Biden would be more amiable to making deals with China than the president. Virus management, we have no idea exactly how that will be managed. Uh, looking at the Biden uh, presidency, a Democratic uh, Senate, and a Democratic House. Obviously, then we're looking at taxes going up. They will not go up. They went down from 35% to 21%. Uh, they went down for corporate taxes. They're expected to go back up to 28%, halfway back. Uh, and again, raising taxes while we're in the COVID, while we're in a recession, I think the Democrats know that if they start raise, raising taxes, that could be much more negative for the economy. So I think they'll wait until we, we get out of this recession before they think about raising taxes. But we'll see. Regulations, obviously, they will increase regulation. Fiscal stimulus, they could pass the $3.5 trillion package if they have a Senate and the House is with them. Trade policy, I think that would be positive where they'll come out and start to uh, figure out a way to work with China. And then the virus management, obviously, is an unknown yet because... Uh, Again, we just don't know what the virus is, how to tackle it, what are, what are the therapies, how can we get uh, uh, more of the vaccines. We're in the process of learning a lot more about this virus right now. Let's look at the charts, the language of the markets. What are the markets trying to tell us? Well, uh, I had put out this number on our daily, daily technicals uh, around 33, the 50-day moving average. Well, we went through that, and the next number I had was around 32.20. We got the 32.29 today and bounced off of it, closed at 32.80. But the next support level is right around the 32.20. If we break below 32.20 on the daily charts, then we have to start looking at the 200-day moving average, which is around 31.04, 31.05, or 31.00. If you get down to 31.00 from 36.00, 35.88, which was the high in the market, that would give us about a 15% correction. 
1 to 10% is a pullback in the stock market, 10 to 20% is a correction in the stock market, 20% and higher is a bear market. I still don't see this as a bear market, but we did make the fifth wave high, and that's what we did right here. Now, are we starting a wave count wave one, wave two, wave three, or is this an ABC? We don't know yet. I still think it's an ABC correction. Uh, I, I know we're only down about seven or eight percent right now in the stock in the s and I think we've got a little bit more to go before we turn it around. We could see a bouncing around here, uh, but I think that the, as the anxiety ramps up more for the election, we're going to see more volatility in the market over the next few weeks. Uh, but looking at the weekly charts, again, 3,200 is the number. Uh, if we break below that, then I'm looking at the, the 3,170 number. That's another number that is in between 3,104, which is the 200-day. And if we break below that, then we're looking at 2,965 or so. If we get below 2,965, I feel then, then that this would be a wave count to the downside. Then we're looking at down about 20% in the market already. Uh, we'll have to start thinking about, are we starting another bear market? I still think that once you get a bear market, a 20% decline, usually it's about 24 months before we see another one. So this would be the quickest bear market, quickest bull market, another bear market uh, within one year. Would be, we've never seen that, but anything is possible in these markets and we have to prepare and look at all contingencies. Next three or four weeks are going to be volatile. Same thing with the NASDAQ. We got below, I had a, t a target of about 10,800 uh, and then about 10,600. 10, we got very close to that, uh, 10,500, I'm sorry. We got very close to that. 10,619 was low and we popped up from there. We break below that, I'm looking at about 10,000 and then we're looking at 9,500 or so. And 9,500 would put the NASDAQ in a bear market uh, on the daily charts, which is the 200-day moving average right along here. So are we going to go, uh, the, usually the NASDAQ goes up faster, it comes down faster, but we're in a very unusual time because we are starting to see the NASDAQ again. Today did a much better. Uh, the NDX, the large cap, uh, was up more. Today it was positive compared to the Dow, which was down 500. So COVID was coming back. It was, again a safety trade rather than the reopening trade. We go from day to day. One day it's all the reopening stocks that go up and then the other day uh, technology goes up which is uh, as we see COVID spread. I think we're going to go back and forth. I feel that we are not going to go all the way down to 9,500. 10,000 is a critical number that I would be watching in the NASDAQ very carefully. Again, uh, if we get below uh, those numbers then we see the market, again, is still in the wave uh, three that we're looking at, and probably our target is somewhere around uh, 14,750 on the weekly charts. That's a long-term projection that we're looking at for the NASDAQ, so we're still a ways to go. Looking at gold, I had mentioned that if we uh, come back around 19, 1870 to 1830, well, we're at 1900. We came down quite a bit today in, in, the, in the gold market. We were down about $40 or so. And then if you get below 1830, we go down all the way to 1730 to 1700. Any pullbacks in gold, first uh, the 1875 number, I'd watch carefully, we get below that, then 1830. I, if we get much below that, then we'll have to take a look at the market overall and see what is happening to the gold market. One of the things that I'm watching very closely is the 10-year note. Uh, when interest rates go down, Bonds go up. Usually people buy bonds for safety. As interest rates are coming down, bonds are going up, people are buying bonds. That means the yield goes down. So we hit a low right here of 0.5 or so, and that's the number I'd be watching very, very closely. 0.6 is good support, or 0.5 right here. If we get below 0.5, we're at 0.67 today, uh, the 10-year note, that's the interest rate. If we get below 0.5, that would be something of a concern for me. That means people are buying bonds and they're worried about the stock market and the economy. They're moving out of stocks and getting into bonds and buying bonds for any return. And they're hardly getting any return, but they're just looking for more safety. That would be one of the indicators that I would be watching. Again, if you need help with your portfolios, give us a call. Uh, contact us at compact.com. There's a, 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 the 
right there on your screen. You see how you can do that, where you can contact us. We'll do a free evaluation of your portfolio. We'll talk about your risk number, show you what your risk number is. That's your emotional risk number. And then we'll find your financial risk number. We'll make sure, and then we'll show you a portfolio that matches that risk number. So you can live through this volatility that you're not concerned and laying in bed and worrying about, oh my God, the market is going down, the market's going up, uh, the election, and all of these things that we are all concerned about. If you have the right allocations, which is the most critical thing to do, to figure out what your emotional risk number is, you can have the best laid financial plans, but if it, they're not the correct emotional plans, when the markets get volatile, you're going to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. That's where we come in and help you guide you through the volatility, hold your hand through the ups and downs of the market and your financial life. So thank you again for tuning in. That is uh, my update. Again, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. You saw that on your screen. Subscribe to it so whenever I do an update, you will get a notification that there is a new YouTube update. And you can see all the charts, all the graphs, and my views. Again, don't forget to tune in to the daily broadcast. Again, thank you again for spending this time. I will keep you updated and tune in to the daily broadcast. Thank you so much.